I want to bring in Politico White House reporter Eli Stokels, who covered the White House during the Trump administration, as well as his 2016 campaign. So I want to ask you about the person who was just on the stand, Madeleine Westerhout, who sat right outside the Oval Office, controlled a lot of the communications for then-President Trump, talked about the checks that he would sign, his micromanagement style, his ability to multitask, she said, and all the rules that he had for everything from Oxford commas in his tweets to the Sharpies he preferred for signing documents. And she says she found that he always knew where things were, that he paid close attention to spending, made calls late into the night. How does all of her testimony square with your reporting on how Trump ran the White House and anything in particular that stands out to you? Well, Anna, thanks for having me. I, I think that the, the picture that she painted is probably a pretty accurate one. Um, the, I saw in some of the courtroom sketches the, the uh, poster board showing the diagram of the Oval Office set up and where her desk was in proximity to the White House. She was right outside. Um, and in the West Wing, uh, proximity to the Oval is power. Uh, she spent so much time around the president, being summoned by the president whenever he needed something. Um, and obviously, the reason she's important here is because uh, she was the connection point when things were happening on the outside and they needed to get to Donald Trump to sign a check or he needed to be aware of something or they were setting things up um, surreptitiously on the outside. She was the one who was sort of the intermediary. She was the one connecting him with Michael Cohen or with other people on the outside, setting up meetings, uh, passing paper, bringing paper into the Oval. So she's obviously critical uh, to the prosecution's case in that sense. Um, and I think that, you know, Donald Trump is a fairly particular boss, right? He likes things a certain way. When he wants a Diet Coke, aides know they better get him that Diet Coke right away. Um, they are very familiar with the way that he would kind of bounce from one activity to the next, uh, how he would get upset by something that he would see on the television in the dining room, the executive dining room just on the other side of the Oval, uh, and would want his phone or would want to tweet about it or would want to send out a statement. When he wanted to see someone in his office, uh, they needed to be in there quickly. And so it would be uh, people like Madeline Westerhood who would be out there trying to, to summon those people and get them into the Oval. So she was very close to the, to the president and had a, a really clear uh, understanding of the way that the Trump White House operated uh, there were a lot of people coming in and out of that oval uh, at certain points. Uh, there was a lot of chaos. There were a lot of controversy swirling around the president at that time. Yeah. He was struggling to find a new chief of staff. There was consternation on the Hill. The Mueller investigation was going. There were a lot of stress points. Um, and she was sort of his first uh, person, you know, first person he would go to when he needed something, wanted something. Um, and, and so she was right in the middle of all of it. And, and you had some fascinating reporting back in, in 2018 about how Trump responded to the reporting of the hush money payments at that time. And you wrote for the L.A. Times then, Trump is loath to admit any fault when forced to confront his previously false statements. Instead, he responds like a retreating army that refuses to surrender. Forced out of one foxhole, he's fallen back to another, only to reposition again and again. And I, I wonder, you know, fast forward six years or so, almost six years, here we are, and this story coming full circle. What do you think is his next move if he's like that army refusing to surrender? Well, he just, he, you know, when I would talk to white collar crime uh, criminologists, people who study this stuff, they would say it's common to see this illusion of invincibility among white collar criminals. But Donald Trump's illusion of invincibility, this idea that he can just adapt to circumstances, change his own circumstances, and that nothing will ever really get to him is unlike anything uh, from any other, you know, white collar uh, criminal that they had ever seen. And obviously, Donald Trump faces a lot of different counts in a lot of different cases here. And he is still, you see it every day, talking to the cameras, responding in the moment. I mean, he is the most sort of present person in terms of like just living in this constant present, not worrying about what he said 10 seconds ago or 10 days ago or three years ago, worrying about right now, always communicating um, and changing his story. And he's not going to be shamed by the fact that that story doesn't line up with what he said before. At that time, the, the piece that you're referring to, and you're really taking me back a ways, <laughs> haven't thought about some of this stuff in a while. But, you know, looking through that, if, at first, when he was asked about the payments, when Michael Cohen was pleading guilty and all this information was coming out, at first, he denied knowing anything about any payments to Michael Cohen. 
Uh, he uh, it's, you sort of dismissed this on Air Force One when he was questioned about it. Then more facts came out. Trump changed his story. He said, well, those were just legal payments. They had nothing to do with any of this. It's no big deal. And then ultimately, as more information came out, he said, well, we didn't do anything illegal. And so you could see him kind of reacting in real time because his strategy is always a political or public relations strategy more than a legal strategy. It has always been the case with Donald Trump that that's how he sees things. Um, and I, I think it's still the way he's operating in, in this trial. You know, a lot of his defense and the reason he's violating this gag order is because he feels the need to communicate with the public to make sure that they, you know, it's his hope that they see this trial as politically motivated uh, and that they are dismissive of what they are hearing about uh, taking place in the courtroom. Eli Stokels, I really appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for joining us.